Ever wanted to control a gecko that won't ever shut up, spouting references that many of us didn't understand? Well, you can, in Gex, and I've beaten every single game in the franchise. Was it worth it? Well, there's only one way to find out, to play all of them and tell you how I felt during each game, and what I've noticed about them as we went through the franchise. My name is Fortifier, and welcome to Series Slayer. In the early 90s, platformers seemed to be the way to make your company's IPs shine, right? In some cases, they were mascots. Think of Mega Man with Capcom, the Belmont Clan with Konami, Kirby with HAL Labs, and Mario with Nintendo. For Crystal Dynamics, it was Gex, a fucking gecko, that really loves watching TV and speaks in TV quotes. Now, as cringe as that might sound, each of us have that era of our life where we answer socially awkward instances in movie quotes. For me, it was Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Chappelle's show, and Borat. My wife, very nice, but Gex, <laughs> Gex was its own beast. Now before we get into the games, I do want to say I have beaten all of these on more platforms than I'm comfortable admitting, and as such, there will be spoilers, specifically about the story. If you're sensitive to these, then you might want to avoid this episode until you've taken the time to play them all. If you're still here, then let's begin. The first game in the Gex franchise is simply Gex, and it was released on quite a few different platforms, the 3DO, PlayStation, and the Saturn in 1995. It also had a PC release in 1996. If you've played it, it's a rather traditional platformer, all things considered, such as Rayman. It has its origins in flat, left-to-right platforming with quality artwork, because that's what it was. Our whole objective is to walk around, crawl around, hit teleport points, basically anything to find Planet X remotes, which as time progresses will lead us to Planet X. The story revolves around Gex, who is an anthropomorphic gecko. He lives by himself watching TV all day because his uncle died, so he inherited tons of money and he's basically just living it up his way, right? Then he gets sucked into the TV by Rez, and our job is to defeat Rez and escape the media dimension. Now what makes this game stand out is that we have all of the abilities of a gecko, a tongue that catches flies, sticky pads on our feet that let us scale walls, and a tail that lets us bounce. Because you know, all geckos are capable of that. Oh, and Gex also likes to consistently shit out one-liners, courtesy of Dana Gould, which if you're me, I don't find Dana Gould to be funny in the slightest. I would have preferred listening to Mitch Hedberg, you know, someone who actually pulls off one-liner jokes well, or really anyone who could do it well. I'm not a huge fan of Gex, period, and it's mostly tied to the fact that he just doesn't shut the fuck up. But outside the character, I find that the game is rather mediocre, but when push comes to shove, it's the best out of all three mainline releases. The next game would be Gex Enter the Gecko, also known as Gex 64 Enter the Gecko. This was the franchise's jump to 3D. The problem is, depending on which version you played, it was either done well or it was done horribly. But let's talk story. Once Gex succeeded in destroying Rez, he returned to a life of solidarity, and two years later, the government showed up and asked him to go back into the media dimension again to defeat Rez, which he refuses to do at first until they offer him a shit ton of money and some nifty gadgets, one of which he doesn't need because he's rich as fuck! At the end of the game, Rez tells Gex that he's his father, but he doesn't give a shit, so he turns off the TV, and then proceeds to tongue-punch Nikki from Pandemonium. True story. So in essence, we're doing everything we were doing in Gex 1, but in a 3D realm, which at the time was a difficult thing to pull off for the 3D era. Bubsy failed miserably, so many franchises tried to base their success on Super Mario 64 to include a shitty camera, which was my main complaint in this game, and in some cases, the controls, which were abhorrent on the Nintendo 64. We go through stages upon stages to find three or two red remotes per stage, one hidden silver remote, and a collect-a-thon remote, but the only ones that we need are the red remotes. If you have enough silver remotes, you can unlock bonus stages that lead to hidden objects that act as bonuses like behind the scenes stuff, and every now and again we have bosses that give us gold remotes. Eventually we work ourselves up to Planet Z and fight Rez, and to be honest, the, the boss fights themselves, they're decent, the rest of the game, it's subpar. One of the big things that drive me insane about Gex as a franchise, at least the last two games, is that we can only get one red remote per play. Think of it like Mario. You get a star, you get booted from the stage, and then you have to do it all over again. I, I don't like that. I'd rather just get all of the collectibles I can and then move on with my life. After beating this, one of my moderators revoked the game and demanded me play the PS1 version, which was fairly decent. The control issues are fixed, but the camera is still much to be desired. And Dana Gould? He never shuts the fuck up, yet again. And as a kid of the 90s, 
I didn't understand 90% of his stupid references. But hey, miss playing Gex in a 2D way? Then play Gex 2, enter the Gecko on Game Boy Color. Yeah, because why not? I mean, how could it get any worse than it was before? Well, it can get much worse. I'm not a fan of AAA titles being relegated or recreated for the handheld spectrum because most, if not all of the time, it's absolute dehydrated, crystallized, rehydrated dog shit. And Gex 2 is exactly that. It's zoomed in 500%, you can only get one remote at a time, and it has atrocious hitboxes. And because it's zoomed in so much, you get lost so easily in the horrible level design. I was not happy to play this, but at least we beat it. The final game was Gex 3 Deep Cover Gecko, and much like the previous two, we're doing the same exact thing with the exact same sins of mankind that drove me insane before. Although we do have new characters, for example, Agent Extra, Alfred the Tortoise, Rex, and Cuz who's Gex's cousin. This time, the game seems to pay a little bit more attention to the story, but at the end of the day, it's the same game, and in some cases, it felt a little bit more slidey when it came to controls. The devs supposedly also added mini games to try to cut the monotony, but I didn't feel that the monotony was cut at all. In fact, I felt that it was just, if not more, monotonous, right? The era of collectathons by 1999 was so played out. After all, Banjo, Donkey Kong, Spyro, they had all mastered it. So this was just another franchise paralleling the trope, right? The one thing that I did enjoy is that this time we had a more believable hub world versus the hub from Gex 2, which was this strange floating Roman platform with pillars and squares. But even then, that's a minuscule aspect. And to me, it didn't really change much. Then we had the Game Boy Color version, which I actually own, and it didn't work, which already made me mad to check it out. But because I'm a glutton for punishment, I obtained it on the seven seas. <laughs> and Gex Deep Pocket Gecko, and let me tell you, I fucking HATE this game. This is hands down one of the most gimmicky bullshit games I have ever played in my life. For the most part, we have all the same levels as Gex 3, except a few didn't make it. It just didn't make sense to add them. We still do the same left to right scrolling that was present in Gex 2. But unfortunately, the level design was exceptionally complex and in some ways ambiguous to the point where for the first time in the series, I needed to rely on a walkthrough. In Gex 2 on the Game Boy, the levels were frustrating, but they were somewhat linear. In Deep Pocket Gecko, they compound levels, meaning you'll do the same route with the same gimmicks over and over and over and over and over again. And now that I think about it, Gex as a franchise did the entire collectathon thing wrong. I would much rather get my major collectible and continue the stage, like Spyro and Banjo, the same thing that I contended with in Gex 2, not get kicked out of the stage because I get a remote. It's not like anything changes in the stage. This isn't Super Mario Sunshine. There's absolutely no changes to the level. It's frustrating. So that being said, is it worth it? No. I do not feel that the Gex franchise is worth it in the slightest. 66% of the franchise is a rather sad attempt at competing with a market for something that was so incredibly saturated at that point in video game history. Gex could have been something better as an action platformer, but Crystal Dynamics took the easy way out, and that's why we will likely never see another Gex title. What's your opinion on the Gex franchise? Do you have positive or negative memories? Feel free to share them down below. Bear in mind, we are ridiculously close to that 4,000 subscriber goal. So if you're new here and want to be part of an awesome community of people who enjoy life when it was easier to live, then feel free to join. Also, the single most important thing you can do for me is to click that thumbs up button or else you'll hear Dana Gould one-liners in your dreams. And the last thing you want is a Dana Gould sleep paralysis demon. As always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes, fortify around.